Senator Clinton, you still draw a wonderful crowd. You always have. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is David Pryor, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School of Government. And to all of you, we say that we're so honored that you would come. I know I speak for Senator Clinton in saying how much she appreciates all of you coming out on this very, very cold March afternoon. I hope none of you are cutting any classes this afternoon. We won't go into that right now. By the way, I started to say that I would just introduce our great speaker and wonderful and longtime friend by saying, here's Chelsea's mother. But then I said, no, I better not do that. We are very honored today that the junior senator from New York, Hillary Clinton, is here with us. It was arranged on some degree of short notice, but notwithstanding that, as always, she is very generous with her time and with her talents. I have known this remarkable woman for, gosh, I guess 25 years or more, something like this. And I can tell you that she is one of the most remarkable people I have ever known. Some of you have had the opportunity to hear her before, and I know that you're going to enjoy hearing her this afternoon. I could go on and on with, about her, but I will simply, in just a moment, turn the program over to my friend Clark Tucker. But first, the first rule, please, turn off your cell phones. Cell phones off. Thank you very much. We're going to proceed about 20 minutes into, uh, for her remarks, and then we're going to open up the four microphones. And we don't want any long speeches. We want very quick, crisp questions to Senator Clinton, and uh, then we will uh, proceed from there. Let me, if I could, introduce today Clark Tucker. Clark Tucker is a young man that I have known almost as long as I have known Senator Clinton. He is, was born in Little Rock, Arkansas. He was the president of the Central High School student body. He has always been a leader. He is still a leader. After getting into Harvard, he also now is the president of the Student Advisory Committee of the Institute of Politics. It is my great honor at this time to present to you Clark Tucker. Clark? Thank you very much, Senator Pryor, for that kind introduction. And it certainly is an honor to join you, uh, a man who has dedicated his entire career to serving this nation with distinction, uh, in welcoming someone who has undoubtedly done the same. There is little I can do to tell you uh, about our guest today that you do not already know. Uh, but in spite of the fact that she attended law school at Yale, <laughs> she is probably the only person in American history who, in addition to her home state, uh, two years ago could have had a legitimate chance of being elected to the United States Senate in two other states, Illinois where she grew up and Arkansas where she served as First Lady so honorably for so many years. But public service has been the focus of Senator Clinton's career and her life long before she rose to national prominence in 1992. When her husband was first elected governor of Arkansas in 1978, many people wondered whether or not she would impose the customs and policies of the northern states where she had grown up. Contrary to those opinions, she came to know and understand Arkansas and the people who live there as if she had never lived anywhere else. Every year I watched her throw out the first pitch at the Hillcrest Softball League. It's a girls softball program, neighborhood program about one mile from where I grew up. Uh, I might add that Chelsea plays one mean third base. <laughs> Through her efforts of getting to know Arkansas so well, she translated this knowledge of Arkansas into effective leadership for the people who live there. As chair of the Arkansas Educational Standards Committee, she, she gives opportunities to students like myself who now have the opportunity to introduce a senator from New York as a student at Harvard University, an opportunity for which I and other students who she helped along the way will always be eternally grateful. She pioneered uh, improving children's health care in Arkansas through her work with the uh, state's children's hospital, and I could go on for hours and hours. And the people of Arkansas recognized uh, Mrs. Clinton in 1984 for her ceaseless effort to work on every half by naming her Arkansas Woman of the Year. Bill Clinton, her husband, his name was on the ballot approximately 10 times in central Arkansas, 
So between both of my parents, they voted for him about 10 times. But my mom, I mean 20 times, I mean, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. But uh, my mom says the only reason she ever voted for Bill was because she was married, he was married to Hillary. <laughs> so uh, our, uh, we Arkansans were a little bit disappointed when she decided to live and ultimately run for the Senate in New York. But nobody in Arkansas was surprised with the success she had when she arrived there. In her time there, she has established a legislative, uh, legislative record that is second to none and surpassed all expectations one, once again. Also, her leadership and her guidance through the turmoil of the uh, atrocities that took place in New York six months ago today has been crucial in uh, allowing New, York to, uh, New York's ability to recover. I personally look forward to watching Senator Clinton's career progress wherever it may take her, whether it be New York, the Institute of Politics, or maybe back to Pennsylvania Avenue in a different role. Please join me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming one of America's greatest public servants, the former First Lady of the United States and the Senator from New York, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Thank you so much, Clark. I'm absolutely delighted to be here, especially to be introduced by you. Um, just like uh, David Pryor, I've known Clark, I think, all of his life, and I've known and admired his parents, and uh, it's one of those great blessings in life to uh, watch young people whom you know and root for uh, do things in their lives that make you proud and it's a real pleasure for me to be here with Clark and of course I am always happy to be with my friend uh, Senator Pryor who has been a great source of inspiration and good humor and advice for many years uh, he is a masterful politician, as those of you at the Institute, I'm sure, have had a chance to experience and learn from. In fact, it doesn't uh, surprise me at all that uh, the president of the student body at uh, the Institute of Politics would be from Arkansas during David's term. Um, I couldn't figure out if that was just a coincidence or, you know, had something to do with, I don't know, butterfly ballots or hanging chads or... <laughs> and to be here with all of you, it's, um, it's a great, great privilege and pleasure. I am delighted this worked out. I know when David uh, first asked me to come, gave me a standing invitation, I didn't uh, know that if, if I would have the opportunity to be able to accept his uh, kind invitation. But today, as some of you know, because you were there, uh, a group of um, my colleagues, women Democratic senators and I, came to Boston to uh, support our colleague, uh, Senator John Kerry, in his reelection. And when David heard that uh, I'd agreed uh, to do that, he, of course, renewed specifically the invitation, and I was happy to accept it is, of course, noteworthy that I started my day this morning in Battery Park, Lower Manhattan, where we took a few moments to commemorate the horrific events of six months ago today. We had a moment of silence for when the first plane hit the first tower, and then we had another moment of silence or when the second plane hit. It's almost hard even now to believe that six months ago today, four airplanes took off in our country on a beautiful September morn, filled with all kinds of people going off to do their business and 
some for pleasure, some to meet with family members. They taxied down runways at Logan and Dulles and Newark. They were cleared for takeoff and rose into the sky, a normal, everyday occurrence that changed our normal every days. The airplanes were, of course, turned into missiles, their pilots into suicide bombers. And all of the passengers, hostages, and heroes are remembered today as they were doomed to share the fate of those who had gotten up and gone to work in the Pentagon or in Lower Manhattan. It's been a terrible six months in many ways. I have met with more victims and survivors than I care even to count. I visited a young woman in the hospital in Manhattan who's been there ever since the landing gear of one of the planes hit her as she ran for safety. I have visited with survivors who've been badly burned in a rehabilitation hospital near where I live in Westchester County. The last time I was in Boston was for the memorial service of a dear friend who was one of the victims of the flights that left Logan. So many Americans have had their lives affected directly and certainly all of us indirectly by that fateful morning. And what are we to make of our obligations and responsibilities? As we are here six months after the worst attack we've ever suffered as Americans, as we attempt to defend ourselves and root out the terrorist network that planned and carried out these attacks. Well, there probably is not a better place to reflect on both what has happened and what we are called upon to do because of September 11th and here at Harvard and certainly at the Institute of Politics. When you think about why the Institute of Politics was even founded to memorialize President Kennedy, someone else whom we lost too soon, and to forge links between the distinct worlds of politics and scholarship, there perhaps are some clues in what it means to be a political citizen what it means to participate in the political process now and in the future based on the work that is done at the Institute. You know, in 1956, when then Senator John F. Kennedy spoke here at Harvard, he said that the political profession needs to have its temperature lowered in the cooling waters of the scholastic pool. It's a wonderful image. He also said at his commencement address on that June day, if more politicians knew poetry and more poets knew politics, I'm convinced the world would be a better place. Well, I am certainly not a poet, but in the months since September 11th, many of us have found refuge in the writings and words of poets and poet philosophers. I think particularly of my friend, the president of the Czech Republic, who has been able to straddle both worlds of poetry and politics, Václav Havel, who has also delivered the commencement address here at Harvard. And one of my favorite quotes of his is that the salvation of the human world lies nowhere else than in the human heart, in the human power to reflect, in human humbleness, and in human responsibility. We've, saw, we've seen a great deal of heart, particularly in New York, a city that was overwhelmed by grief and sorrow and yet got up and kept going 
family after family that finally had to accept the fact that their husband and father their wife and mother their son their daughter their loved one would not come home and the firefighters who lost so many and the police officers and the emergency rescue workers we've seen the very best of the human heart we've also been humbled humbled in the face of the unspeakable and the unimaginable humbled as we've tried to make sense as we've talked to children about what happened and humbled in the use of human power human power not only to reflect but to react to use it to try to make sense of the evil that did occur but at the same time to understand that the task before us requires more than military power and of course to take responsibility I think all of us could recall where we were on that morning six months ago I certainly remember being on the way to a hearing that was going to begin to address early childhood education with the first witness being the first lady Laura Bush when everything suddenly changed we were evacuated the hearing of course was canceled and we were suddenly and jarringly thrust into the uncertainty of not knowing what might happen next like many of you I tried to find my husband and my daughter and to check on friends and found that the circuits were overloaded and kept trying and trying until I could be sure that my daughter was safe and that my husband knew everything that was happening I also like so many of you stayed up and watched television while I talked on the phone to everyone who I could reach the mayor the governor the people who were dealing with this tragedy on the front lines and the next day along with Senator Schumer I flew with the FEMA director Joe Albaugh to see for myself nothing that I had thought been told or seen on television or in the morning papers prepared me for what I saw that afternoon the skies were totally clear because of course all flights had been grounded except for essential government and military missions so we flew all by ourselves into LaGuardia and then we got into helicopters and circled lower Manhattan where the site of devastation was so much greater than I had thought I would see the burning rubble the threat of another collapsing building that made people run for their lives again before my very eyes and then on the ground after joining with the governor and the mayor we went as close as we could and could only see a wall of gray soot the closest analogy that I can even call from my memory is it truly was like peering through the gates of hell yet even at that moment coming through the darkness walking toward us were emergency workers firefighters and others who were taking some relief who were going to get something to eat and they emerged from that darkness covered with soot dragging their equipment their axes behind them and it was a scene that embodied both the tragedy and the destruction as well as the resoluteness and the commitment that kept everyone going and had led so many to lose their lives running toward danger instead of away from it today as we meet here at Harvard there are other young men and women many your age some younger a little older who 
who are continuing the fight that was begun against us, the young men and women in our military. Some I have met because they are from the 10th Mountain Division, from Fort Drum in upstate New York. And I have met with them and eaten with them, and then after they were deployed secretly before anyone could know publicly where they were going, I went up to meet with their families. So I have their faces embedded in my memory as well. And what does this say to those of us who are safely going about our studies or our jobs, our lives, thinking about our own futures? Well, for me, there is no doubt that we now face a level of danger and insecurity in the world that we haven't had to live with, certainly for your lifetimes. And going back as far as I can remember, some similar feelings from the 1950s when we were told to do our drills to avoid the nuclear bomb fallout that some feared would come during the Cold War. But it never became real to most of us. We didn't see buildings collapse, and we didn't know about people who died right before our eyes on television. And so we truly are charting for this generation, for all Americans, new ground. And how we do it will say a lot about who we are and what kind of nation and world we want to make. During my campaign, I often used the idea that President Franklin Roosevelt had so memorably given us when he talked about his generation having a rendezvous with destiny, a destiny that called them from depression, called them into war, all them for sacrifice. We haven't been confronted by that. That's not my generation. That's my parents and my grandparents, your grandparents and great-grandparents in many cases. But we have been called, if you will, for a rendezvous with responsibility, the responsibility that comes when we do face real danger, and we do have to be more vigilant, but also the responsibility that requires us to take more seriously our political and civic obligations. We are citizens of a democracy that relies upon each of us to do our part. And I know that for many young people today, the questions that are being posed about what that means are causing lots of conversations. I hear them among my daughter's friends. I had that conversation with a young man who worked for me as my press secretary in New York, who after September 11th decided to join the Navy. People are trying to determine what is it that requires and calls them to responsibility. I believe that the events of September 11th have the potential to make us an even stronger nation. Out of the crucible of death and destruction, we can forge a stronger, safer world. But it is not up just to those of us who serve in office. Most fundamentally, it is truly up to those who hold the highest position in our democracy, that of citizen. Some are clearly doing their duty, as the firefighters did, as our men and women in uniform are doing. But what does it mean for us? How do we define our duty 
what responsibility are we called to achieve? I think we can, in a very general way, think both about the world we have inhabited since September 11th, with all of its new dangers and threats, and the world of September 10th, because the challenges we faced then are just as real and important as well. In the post-September 11th world, we do have to defend ourselves. We have to be willing to stand for freedom and for the values that we not only hold dear, but which we believe are the birthright of every human being. You can read about them in our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. I happen to think they're universal. Different cultures and different societies at different points of time can make a different choice about how human beings should live and what kind of political systems should govern them. But it is clear to me that the universal values at the root of our political system embodied in the Declaration of Human Rights that nations sign off on whether they follow them or not are worth fighting for and worth dying for. And so we do have to face a determined adversary. And yet at the same time, we cannot just respond militarily, although we have to use the force at our disposal to meet the enemy wherever they may be. But we also have to recognize that part of America's greatness is in widening the circle of opportunity around the world, in creating conditions for more boys and girls to feel that they too can have a future that gives them the chance to live up to their God-given potential. That is why I think while we are investing more in our military, while we are rightfully investing more in our homeland security, we should also be investing in more in development aid, more in family planning, more in education for girls and boys, more in health care, more in the kinds of tasks and activities that will help to create opportunity around the world. And we have to do a better job of explaining who we are. Who is this great, unmatched superpower? Well, we are the nation that went to war for Muslims in Bosnia and Kosovo. We are the nation that has tried repeatedly to create regimes around the world that would pay more attention to human rights, sometimes being told we had no business talking about freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of conscience. We have to do a better job of exporting our values, as good a job as we do in exporting our popular culture, so that we give people a fair look at who we are and a fair chance to understand what we believe we're fighting for. that we can continue to implement the tax cuts. The world has changed since last spring, and we should have leadership that recognizes that and calls all of us, particularly the richest among us, to sacrifice. It is only right and fair. <laughs> it
It is only right that as we think about the world we want to create in the future, a world where we have more partners instead of more terrorists, a world where we can help create conditions that give young children a better chance at life, that we should have the same futuristic thinking about the problems we face at home. We are debating an energy bill in the Senate now, and I think the fairest way to say it is that it is a debate between those who want the energy policy of the past and those who want an energy policy of the future that makes us self-sufficient, independent, using more alternatives, investing in conservation, and having the security that comes from knowing that we're making decisions that will stand the test of time. And for And for many of us, the debate over the energy bill is also a debate about the environment and the economy. And as we look forward into the future, we must all be environmentalists. This is no longer a movement. This must become a way of life. And we particularly have to do more to understand the intersection between our health and our environment. We know that there is a linkage. Our genetics, our environment, our behaviors largely determine our health until the day inevitably we pass from this earth. Now we know that smoking causes health problems. We know that Working with asbestos causes health problems. And we are increasingly knowing what else causes health problems. And last week, I held a hearing in which we received a report of a 16-year research project that proved definitively that pollution, mostly power plant emissions and gas and diesel emissions, causes heart disease, and lung cancer. Now, there are those who will say we need more evidence, but they are not people who are living in the most polluted areas of our country, breathing the backup of diesel fumes and breathing the air that comes from power plants that don't want to comply with the Clean Air Act and the new source review rules. And what we have to be willing to do is to say, no one can pollute the environment any longer without taking into account the health effects of what that pollution leads to. That's the kind of future-oriented policy we need to be pursuing. We also have to stand up for economic security. It is not acceptable in our country that people who have worked hard and thought they were providing responsibly for themselves by investing in their retirement security should have the rug pulled out from under them, while those who were entrusted with the fiduciary duty of looking out for their employees walk away with millions of dollars. This Enron scandal is not just about one corporation. It is about a corporate ethos. And it is long past time for us to call upon our corporate leadership to understand that they are not just responsible for the bottom line, but for workers' lives as well. And part of that will come when we pass the kind of pension reform and economic security legislation that is being called for today. I also hope that before the Easter recess, we will finally, once and for all, pass campaign finance reform and like to see us pass election reform so that it would at least have a chance of being implemented before the next election, which would send a great signal to our country. 
And I would like to see the Congress once and for all pass hate crimes legislation that would tell every citizen they matter. In short, while I have been working on homeland security with respect to northern border security, bioterrorism preparation, more security at our nuclear plants, our utilities, our bridges, our tunnels, our rails, our ports, and while I will support putting the kind of investments we need into that kind of security, we not only have to worry about national security and homeland security, but we should also be working for economic security, homeland energy security, homeland health security, homeland environment security. When we talk about security today, we should be preparing to build the kind of future where our children are secure to go outside and play without having to worry about the environment, where every man and woman who goes to work doesn't have to worry about their Social Security, their Medicare, or their pensions being taken away from them, and where we all understand that part of our responsibility today is to demonstrate to ourselves and the rest of the world that we want to create the fairer, safest, strongest, smartest, and yes, richest country we can, not only for us to enjoy, but to spread the blessings that come from freedom to everyone willing to be responsible in our own country and around the world. Now, I know very well that we can't get everything done. We have to be realistic. I understand that. But it matters what we aim for. It matters what our shared goals are. I'm reminded of Dr. Martin Luther King saying that life is a long, continual story of setting out to build a great temple and not being able to finish it. The story of America is like that. It took years and years for us to recognize the common shared humanity of African Americans, to permit women to vote, to break down the barriers to people based on their ethnicity and their religion, their sexual orientation, their disability, all of those differences that too often are used to set us apart from one another. So yes, the work is never finished, but half the joy is being engaged in doing it and seeing then how much progress you have contributed to. We understand that reflecting back on September 11th, our fate is a mystery. None of the people who got up that morning and got on those airplanes or went to work thought it would be their last day on this earth. We don't hold our future in our control, but it does matter what we stand for and what we believe. And it particularly matters to young people. All of the issues that I've briefly mentioned are frankly more important to you and my daughter than they are to me. And that's why it's so critical for all of you to care about and become involved in the political process. Maybe it's just fulfilling your obligation to vote, which far too few young people do. Maybe it's working on a campaign or educating yourself about an issue you feel passionately about, writing those emails and letters and making those phone calls and joining those groups that stand for whatever it is you care deeply about that will make a difference in your future. However you choose to participate, I can only urge you with all my heart to choose. You know, six months after this terrible event, I get up every single day determined to do whatever I can to honor the memory of all the people we lost, some of whom I knew, some I 
didn't know in life but have gotten to know because of their family's love and cherished memories and we owe it to them and we owe it to their children all the babies that have been born since september eleventh who will never know their fathers all the babies who will never know their mothers again politics has to be about the future it can't be about maintaining the advantage of any one group for the time being it can't be about just rewarding those who've already made it in life it has to be about building that greater temple knowing we'll never finish it but feeling like we gave some child somewhere a better chance because we tried thank you very much Well, we're going to have a series now of short, short questions. No speeches, because if you make a speech, I'm going to cut you off. We're going, to have, we're going to have the same rules that we have in the forum, and uh, we're going to move very, very rapidly. We're going to start right here. And I, I cannot see very well, but let's start right here. Good afternoon, Senator. My name is Lara Satrakian. I'm a sophomore at the college and a resident of New York City. Both as a resident of New York and as a citizen of the United States, I'd like to know your opinion on the course America has taken abroad in the war on terrorism and whether you would have done anything differently if you had been directing our national action. Well, Laura, um, I have supported the President's uh, actions. I thought that they were merited and needed to be implemented as effectively as possible. I have been a very strong voice of unity because I think that uh, in a time when our country has been attacked and we need to defend ourselves, uh, our political differences uh, should be subordinate to our unified support of the military action that is underway and particularly for the men and women carrying it out. I also believe that it is not only appropriate but patriotic to ask questions about tactics and strategy. That's part of the American way. Um, and I've been a little dismayed at those who would suggest that members of the Senate or the House or any American somehow doesn't have a right to raise concerns about our uh, approach toward uh, the uh, position we've taken both in Afghanistan and elsewhere around the world. I think that our most important task is to finish what we've started in Afghanistan and to make very clear that we have exhausted and eliminated the Al-Qaeda network and their allies insofar as that is possible. The rather extraordinary battle that took place this past week demonstrated clearly that we still have uh, some work ahead of us to be able to clear out the caves, to uh, seek after any of the uh, terrorists who are seeking uh, refuge in, um, elsewhere in Afghanistan or across the border in Pakistan or elsewhere. I think that has to remain our obligation and that should remain our military objective. I also believe it is important for the United States to play a leadership role in the stabilizing of security in Afghanistan. Otherwise, I am concerned that in the absence of some stability beyond 
just the capital of Kabul, it is likely that we could see an implosion that could lead to the return of the terrorist network operating out of uh, an even more chaotic situation uh, than before. It certainly could lead to the resumption of battles and uh, warfare among the warlords who caused a lot of the uh, outcry that led to the Taliban in the first place because of the way they mistreated people. So Afghanistan is a very difficult environment militarily, politically, in every way that we can understand it. Therefore, the United States must be a leader in both our military efforts and in, in our efforts to stabilize the country. So I support what the President's done. I would want to see us continue on the course in Afghanistan and also be more open than the administration has shown thus far to uh, creating a, as stable a situation as we are along with our allies and uh, using troops from uh, those who would be inclined to uh, uh, commit them uh, in Afghanistan over a period of time until we can try to get it stabilized. I think that has worked uh, in Bosnia and Kosovo so far, which uh, we've been able then to withdraw troops from, and others have both taken on the responsibility and the, the need has somewhat diminished. So I think we have to continue to watch this very closely. Okay, let's go right here with the New York Yankees cap. <laughs> okay. My hat didn't give me away. I'm a native New Yorker, uh, freshman into college, and you gave a speech that I think was after my own heart and after the hearts of many people in the audience, but I'm wondering what's after your own heart? And you mentioned wonderful trend of idealism and of action on those ideals that has been inspired, maybe um, just that's increased after September 11th, but um, of the groups that you've encountered, perhaps some of the smaller, less well-known groups, which ones, if you were just a little bit younger, do you think that you might want to participate in? Um, because you're busy running the country, so um, <laughs> if, if you could, maybe, um, I'm sure they would love you for it and we'd love to hear about them. I think Thank that's you. a really, a really interesting question. And, and there are so many opportunities. I, I happen to believe very strongly in service, community service. I think that AmeriCorps here at home has been a tremendous opportunity for young people. A lot of my friends, uh, uh, sons and daughters, after they have finished college, have gone into AmeriCorps. I think the Peace Corps is still a tremendous experience. Uh, I believe that City Year, founded right in Boston, is one of the great service opportunities that's available to young people. Anything that gives you the chance to really do hands-on work on behalf of someone else and get to know something about another kind of life that is being led right here in America or elsewhere in the world, maybe in a different part of the country that uh, you haven't experienced, uh, really does build a commitment and that level of responsibility that I, I hold highly. I think military service for people, I was uh, very proud of my young press secretary when he decided that he was going to serve. I think it's an option that more young people should look at. The, the level of uh, intelligence and understanding of global affairs among our um, military, both enlisted and officer corps, is extraordinary. I think there are also many other kinds of issues that would appeal to individuals to pursue. There are people who feel passionately about the environment. There is so much work to be done about educating each other about the environment becoming an expert on energy. This big debate we're having now about whether we should drill in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge or not, students should be actively involved in that. We need to hear from you about that. When it comes to everything from tutoring in a school, helping uh, a young person get a better shot at uh, academic success, to working in a hospital, I just think there are so many opportunities for service. And from what I know about the young people today, it's a very service-oriented uh, generation, and I urge everyone to find a way to be involved. And then finally, I would just reiterate that, you know, politics is the way we make decisions in a democracy. And there's been a lot of um, denigration of politics over the last years. It's easy to take shots at politicians. We're only human, and uh, everybody has their flaws, and they can be held up and magnified and ridiculed. But most of the people that I know that uh, serve, you know, do it because they really believe in something and they want to make a difference. I may not agree with what they believe, but they believe it sincerely and profoundly. 
So getting involved, working in a campaign, volunteering in, a, in someone's office, you know, every year I have dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, young people come to work in my offices. I couldn't run my Senate office without the help of young people. So both in terms of straight kinds of community service and the kind of political involvement and public uh, service uh, participation, there are so many opportunities and I'd urge you to just explore and find out what you think would be interesting to you. And speaking of volunteerism, in our audience on the first row, we have the former director of AmeriCorps, Mr. Eli Siegel. Eli, take a bow. Thank you. That was unrehearsed, unplanned. Okay, is there a mic in the bow? Oh, is that a mic way up there? Okay, go ahead. I need binoculars. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Teresa House, and I'm a sophomore at the college from Memphis, Tennessee. You can't see me. <laughs> um, the question that I have for you is that you've spoken a lot about the type of destruction that results from intolerance. And over the past few months, in light of the growing violence in Israel and Palestine, you seem to have indicated that you support the Israeli administration over that of the Palestinian Authority. My question to you is, as the violence continues to expand, how should the United States react? And more importantly, who should we support in the vital? Well, I don't think there's any doubt uh, that we have to and we should support Israel. And I have been involved in and working uh, to be in some way helpful on uh, the terrible uh, struggles that exist uh, in the Middle East for many years now. And if one looks at the extraordinary effort that successive Israeli governments made, starting with Prime Minister Rabin and including Prime Minister Netanyahu and Perez and uh, Barak, to try to work out some secure and lasting peace with Yasser Arafat and the Palestinians, I think the only fair assessment of what occurred during the Oslo process is that Israel did everything it knew to do to make offers that could lead to a successful resolution of the negotiations. For reasons that I leave to history and psychology, Yasser Arafat was unwilling or unable to assume the leadership positions to take the responsibility uh, that might have led toward a secure and lasting peace. And I also, based on the intelligence that I receive and the assessments that uh, I'm given have absolutely no doubt that the escalation of the violence, the provocations, the suicide bombers are within at least the knowledge, if not the control, of Yasser Arafat. And that, of course, puts Israel in an impossible position because when your people are being killed by people who are willing to die to kill them, and when there is no response from the other side, and in fact you intercept uh, a boatload of smuggled weapons to try to uh, even up the level of violence, uh, you have to defend yourself. And certainly Israel has had to defend itself. Now there isn't, I think everyone recognizes, and I certainly saw that again personally when I was in Israel two weekends ago, uh, everyone understands that this terrible loss of life takes innocent people. There's no doubt about it. But it could stop literally tomorrow, I believe, if Yasser Arafat were ever to decide that he wanted it to stop. Just as he got around to arresting the assassins of the former tourism ministry, he could call off the Al-Aqsa Brigade and Fatah and Tanzim and Force 17, and he could end the violence. For his own reasons, that is not the choice he makes. The United States has a tremendous stake and responsibility in supporting Israel and in guaranteeing any peace that Israel were to enter into. Right now, I'm pleased that the President is sending General Zini back to the region. I'm pleased that uh, the Vice President will be in Israel this week. Uh, and I hope that uh, the um, Floating of a peace proposal by the Saudis has uh, some uh, realistic chance of uh, uh, being uh, accepted by the uh, Arab world. Uh, and I hope that we're able to 
begin talking again about implementing the Tenet and Mitchell uh, agreements. But I, I believe that the United States supports Israel not only because Israel is a democracy, but also because we have a lot of shared values uh, that uh, unite us and have over time. And that as someone who has worked very hard to create conditions that would give a better life to Palestinians, it was a, a tremendous setback when Yasser Arafat walked away from the chance to become a peacemaker and a leader. I hope he can get back to thinking more along those lines than what we've seen in recent months. Good afternoon, Senator Clinton. My name is Teron Evans. I'm a second year graduate student at the um, Harvard Design School for Architecture. And I'm also a native Floridian. Um, and this past presidential election was the first election that I voted in. And to say that you know, I was appalled that the manner in which the election was conducted would be a gross understatement. So my question to you is, what issues do you think should be specifically addressed so that the Supreme Court does not elect yet another president in the future? Well, for, first let me say with all my heart that uh, don't give up voting. Um, you know, I've had young people from Florida uh, say that it was the first time they ever voted and they'll never vote again, which of course, you know, gives a great victory to the people who don't want you to vote. And so I hope that uh, you will be even more resolute in voting. And I hope that we will pass election reform so that there isn't any doubt that your vote will count. Now, I was a little, um, shall I say, uh, surprised when I learned that despite having passed election reform in the Florida legislature, the Florida House of Representatives has decided not to fund election reform. So they can get the credit for having said they passed it, but everybody who knows anything about what it means to actually get implemented will understand that they haven't really done it, uh, which I think is you know, gives cynicism a bad name. And I would hope that there's enough pressure on the political process in Florida that they will actually implement the kind of election reform that will make sure nothing like what happened in Florida ever happens anywhere in America again. So please, please, vote often, every chance you get. <laughs> Senator Clinton, my name is Emily Whiting. I'm a candidate for a master's in public administration at the Kennedy School and also a social worker. I grew up in Rochester, New York. Uh, my family still lives there. Um, my parents were public servants and are tethered to the VIA health system through their uh, retirement plan. Um, as you know, last spring, Genesee Hospital closed, sent a flood of patients to Rochester General. Um, last semester, I watched my mother die an untimely death, and I blame the poor quality of care that she got from the overwrought uh, VIA health system. My father just told me last weekend that they're going to be taking some more doctors out of Rochester General Hospital, and I'm very concerned about his well-being. My question for you is, what can you do to make the VIA health system do a better job of serving the citizens of Rochester? Well, I'm very aware of the terrible problems that we have seen in Rochester and uh, we are trying to uh, provide more support, more financial backing so that uh, the system isn't overwhelmed as you described. But we face some very big challenges and I'll just try to outline them quickly for you. First of all, in this budget that the President has submitted because of the insistence not only on implementing the tax cuts from last spring but asking for additional tax cuts, there is not adequate money to fund Medicare, to fund Medicaid, to fund public hospitals. And we have got to be willing to provide uh, the dollars that it takes to offer quality service to everyone. Secondly, the Patients' Bill of Rights sits held hostage because we can't get it out of the conference committee between the House and the Senate. And I think that uh, putting doctors back in charge of the health care decisions and empowering nurses is one of the ways to have better health care. And, <laughs> and, you know, finally, though, you, you know, I'm sure you remember that I had a lot to say about health care uh, some years ago. Uh, and I've, I learned a lot about uh, what our political system uh, would and wouldn't bear, obviously. 
But there isn't any doubt in my mind that we have to address overall health care quality, affordability, uh, and delivery. And that we made a very um, you know, short-term and, and uh, ultimately unsuccessful effort to incrementalize our way out of a situation in which more and more people are becoming uninsured again, in which even people with insurance, like your parents, find that the fine print doesn't give them the care that they thought they would get, where we have our hospitals, our nursing homes, uh, our public health facilities overwhelmed by unmet needs.